John Fraser is a native Glaswegian, a father of five, and a Celtic, Celtic fan. He arrived, first arrived in Australia via Russia, Mongolia, and Siberia, wearing a second-hand kilt in 35 degrees Celsius. He is Professor of Queensland and Bonn University, and Associate Professor in Engineering at Q, uh, Queensland University of Technology. He runs a critical care research group. That's probably enough, isn't it? Uh, yeah. That's lovely. And he's Director of ICU in the uh, St Andrews War Memorial Hospital. Lovely. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Sadly, it's not all true. Um, thanks very much for giving us the opportunity to present the research that's um, part of our team. Um, uh, a lot of the work, as, as usual, I love the last speaker who said she's happy to do people's night shift. I think she's happy to take names at the end. In our group, uh, I'm presenting the work from, from our group. Most of whom did much more of the work than I did. Um, some of this, we've had some money from, from companies, but we work with a number of different companies and a number of different uh, research grant agencies. So I just thought we'd pop them all up there so you can feel free to ignore or, or otherwise. Um, we've got a problem in the intensive care, and uh, we get stuck with people who are sick, and the modalities of imaging the lungs are not perfect. And this is a standard-looking chest X-ray, and you don't think there's probably too much wrong with this chest X-ray, a ventilated chest X-ray. But it's probably got, you'd think, a homogenous looking insult. But if you look at the actual CT, uh, you can see here that there's little abscesses and cavities and all sorts. And you'd imagine that the lung at the front here versus the lung at the back here has total different pressures and total different ventilation requirements. But what we get instead of being able to measure what's happening here and here is we get a ventilator that gives us a global number, which is really a composite of the multi-compartments that make up a lung. So we use a lot of electrical impedance tomography to look and see what's happening regionally within the lung of ventilation. And essentially it's a technique where you can pop a belt on and look and see as the patient breathes in, breathes out, where air is going and what changes are made by suctioning, by position, by recruitment and by other modalities. <coughs> Excuse me. As a part of a larger body of work, we looked at cardiac surgery. We do a large amount of cardiac surgery in our institution and we know that patients are getting older, um, a bit fatter, and staying longer, and that blocks our beds. And uh, we were interested in the respiratory compromise, and these are some of the reasons that there is respiratory compromise post-cardiac surgery. Um, we looked at high flow in the cardiac surgical unit, and unfortunately, this is the airway pressure readings. This is um, what happens when you're the boss of the group. So the nasopharyngeal pressure manometer was put down my nose. Um, this is on low flow, and this is high flow. Um, you only need about 30 seconds, but the nurses had ever seen me stop talking for more than 30 seconds. So it was left in me for five minutes. And I said, do we not have the data? We had the data four minutes ago, but we just liked the idea of you stopping talking for a while. But essentially, this shows us um, just from the nasopharynx that high flow gives us a, a positive end expiratory pressure. It's not PEEP, but it's, um, it's very cyclical, but there is a, a, a pressure effect that high flow is giving us. Um, there's different ways that high flow works. We think we give it a little bit of CPAP, or it's not really CPAP, but positive expiratory pressure. There's improvement of dead space, reduced work of breathing, decreased respiratory rates, and possibly improved compliance. And this is what we sort of see on an EIT when we attach it. There's breathing in and out. And this area is nice and open. This lung's open. This one's got a bit more crud down the base of it. When we move from um, a low flow state um, here, and we'll just change the colours just to confuse it a bit, to 30 litres, to 50 litres, what we can really see is that the higher the flow, the more the lung opens up. And we were interested in the cardiac surgical patient population, and it'd be, be, before the study and presentation, now, what we showed was end expiratory lung volume with high flow increased, the respiratory rate reduced, um, and we published this in the, the BGA showing that it improved um, compliance, respiratory rate, increased tidal volume in cardiac surgeons. Um, cardiac surgical patients. We saw initially in the observational study it worked better in the fatter people, but that hasn't really been borne out. But this brought us to think, well, this is happening post the insult. Maybe um, as the intensive care population is changing, there's a rule that high flow was initially only used in the intensive care, and then we started using it in the ED. And then the other question was, perhaps this is a device that could be used at home. And if we look at the massive burden of COPD, and it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger, um, we look to the COPD patient population. If we can try and avoid them coming to intensive care and getting them ventilated, you've heard a lot about the e-core devices, you heard a lot about NIV. Maybe if we even go simpler still, we can stop them coming into hospital. This is a nice study done by a group of Kiwis in the publishing the BMG, and it was looking at patients who were serious COPDs, and they were brought in by ambulance, by paramedics, 
and this isn't high flow by nasal, but six or ten litres by a mask on the left hand side, versus titrated oxygen, aiming for a SATs of around 88 to 90. And risk of COPD, and they controlled it, about 200 patients each. Then they were subdivided in intention to treat and looked at about 92 versus 43 patients. And they treated them either with saturations of 80 or 90, or just they're sick, we'll get them saturations of 100%. And, what, and we've got to remember that this is a patient population that's coming towards us. This is the life expectancy in 1900, 2010, and it's going to continue. So we're going to be seeing more and more of these patients arriving. And are we going to ventilate all of them? Or can we keep more of them at home out of intensive care? And what the study showed in New Zealand was <clears throat> if we give patients that are COPDs too much oxygen, they get respiratory acidosis, they get bradypnea, and they get sicker. The risk of death by titrating oxygen and stopping hypercarbia was reduced by 78%. So this is not ICU, this is patients being brought in acutely in an ambulance with COPD. So it really shows that titrated oxygen significantly reduces mortality hypercapnia and respiratory acidosis in the pre-hospital setting. So we got to thinking, maybe if we can reduce respiratory acidosis, maybe uh, oxygen is not the main thing, maybe it's reducing respiratory acidosis. So we looked at the idea of having looked at a cardiac surgical patient population, perhaps something like a, CO, a high flow device in the community um, could also drop the respiratory acidosis and that may lead to long term benefits. So we um, got ethics approval for male COPD patients that were all home oxygen dependent. We did 30 patients, ideally BMI of less than 30, and they were withdrawn if they got too anxious. And we attached them to the EIT device, respiratory impedance plethysmography, transcutaneous CO2 and transcutaneous PO2, so not just SATs. But we didn't want to put art lines in these people, so it gives us an actual tissue PO2 and tissue PCO2, respiratory rate and respiratory function, EIT. Um, and these are the sort of devices we had on them. So they are they're plumbed and lined quite nicely. 30 patients, 20 minutes in a setup. So they're all home oxygen. They go to their clinic, then they come up to our lab and we, we start assessing them there. Baseline, treatment one, washout, treatment two, recovery. Um, R1 and R2 is randomized ERVO or standard cannula just to make sure it's not a time effect. Just zip through this data, very little difference. Baseline standard ERVO from saturations. Heart rate, not much difference either. Transcutaneous oxygen um, dropped a bit when you move from baseline onto ERVO, and that, that really twitched some people. And I think this is really just moving from four litres, as most of them are on high, uh, nasal prongs. When you go into a high flow and we're using 30 litres, this is just a dilutional effect. You've taken 30 litres of air and diluted the four litres of oxygen. So I think it's a dilutional. Interesting, the SATS probe doesn't show it, but the transcutaneous O2 shows it substantially. But that's of an interest. We thought this was probably much more interesting and much more important physiologically. The transcutaneous PCO2, so the tissue PO2, PCO2, sorry, dropped by about 10%. And if you look at the, uh, the drop off here of ERVO versus nasal prongs, so we're really dramatically dropping the PCO2, the tissue PCO2, and looking at patient by patient, every single patient, I think bar one, uh, two, sorry, bar two dropped their transcutaneous PCO2. Along with that, dropping the, res dropping the CO2, the respiratory rate was interestingly also dropping, and it dropped by even more. It dropped by about 15 or 18 percent, which is counterintuitive, because if they're dropping the respiratory rate, you'd think their CO2 would go higher. So something else is going on. Again, this is uh, just represented in a different way. IE ratio really doesn't change. And part of what was happening was the ERVO, and this is, I think, only part of what was happening, the ERVO is increasing the tidal volume associated with it. Um, P of less than 0 0.01. Minute ventilation because the rate was going down, tidal volume was going up, pretty much stayed the same thing. So what we concluded from this is that um, the use of an ERVO device drops the respiratory rate, is associated um, with dropping CO2, and therefore we'd imagine we didn't do pH testing, but the respiratory acidosis we think will go down and tidal volume is increased. ERVO is well tolerated and transcutaneous oxygen drops, but this is probably not a huge issue because all you need to do, if you want to titrate, as the Kiwi showed in the BMJ paper, all we need to do is add in a little bit, little bit more supplemental oxygen by titrating for 88 to 90 because this is a 400 patient study that they've done and they've shown a mortality difference. So we think this is an interesting thing. Part of it's also going to be CO2 washout, dead space clearance, and we're doing a lot of other physiological tests. But if I've got a spare minute or so, I might just go and show a couple of other bits and bobs that this is then led on to. So it's nice that we've taken from cardiac surgical to the community and then with paediatrics and with Andrea Schibler and Kath Maitland, we've done a study that we've got some funding for across in Africa, taking the ERVO device, having seen this, 
thought maybe in the paediatric population we may be able to improve outcomes um, around Uganda and Kenya. And this is a study with Peter Olipat Olipat. This is the sort of place that we've taken EIT devices to in Uganda. Um, it might look like um, uh, Melbourne to you, but it's not. Um, this is the outpatient department. It's one of the busiest outpatients. This poor doctor works just continuously, and the mums just sit there with all the bubs. Overcrowding like you've never seen it. These people don't actually have oxygen. Um, there's oxygen is too expensive. And what you actually see is the thing. So what they use is an oxygen concentrator. And the oxygen concentrator feeds not to one patient, as it's meant to, but feeds to an old hemic cell bottle that they use as a reservoir. And then they'll feed seven or eight kids off this hemic cell bottle um, and so that each child gets some oxygen. How much they're getting, no one's got any idea um, because there is the money's not there for the oxygen. So we've now adapted this room in, in, in Kenya and it's now got Airvo devices, EIT. We're actually looking at um, uh, NAVA, you're looking at diaphragm activity to see whether the Airvo, which we started looking at in cardiac surgery and onto COPDs, whether even without using oxygen, it can reduce the respiratory mortality and morbidity associated in sub-Saharan Africa. So um, not quite what you were billed, but I thought it'd be interesting and I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you.